of all it by itself. It just, it does it itself. Okay? <laughs> yeah, you're right there with me though. Every time I open the hangar door to go flying, I realize that I'm one of the lucky guys doing something that I dreamt of as a kid.
September 29, 1938, Hap Arnold became chief of the Army Air Corps. With Andrews, he briefed General Marshall on the air facts of life. On the day following Arnold's appointment, the Munich Agreement was signed. Without firing a shot or dropping a bomb, Hitler's military machine had won for him a great victory. But Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain thought he had achieved peace, peace in our time. The very next day, 500 German aircraft assisted in the invasion of the Sudetenland. By appeasement, Hitler had conquered Czechoslovakia. Munich taught America a great lesson. In international diplomacy, as in poker, you can't win if someone else holds all the aces. So in 1939, the Air Corps began to expand to give the nation minimum air protection. And young Americans came to Texas to learn how to walk in the flight boots of air heroes like Thomas Selfridge, Eddie Rickenbacker, and Billy Mitchell. For advanced training, we sent the fledgling flyer to nearby Kelly Field. There, he flew an AT-6. American Aircraft Company, North American Aviation, built more than 17,000 versions of this airplane beginning in 1935. As a pilot training aircraft, it's been used mostly by the United States, Britain, and Canada, but more than 60 countries worldwide have flown it on various missions. The U.S. military started training its pilots in this sturdy, capable plane during World War II. The Army Air Corps and later the U.S. Air Force called it the T-6, then the AT-6 for advanced trainer. The Navy called it the SNJ, and for many years, naval aviators carrier qualified in it. The British and Canadians called it the Harvard. American pilots trained in the T-6 for over 30 years. The United States and many other countries modified the T-6 for combat and other missions. American T-6s flew forward air control missions in both the Korean and Vietnam Wars. More than 600 T-6s are privately owned in North America. Uh, many people think that because it's a trainer, that it's easy and comfortable to fly, that it's forgiving of pilot errors. The opposite is true. Connie Edwards, an iconic American aviator, says that as an advanced trainer, it was designed not to be easy to fly. In fact, he suggested that if a pilot wants to fly it, they should first fly the Navy Bearcat, then the P-51 Mustang, then move to the T-6, where they might have better luck with the tricky ground handling. This T-6, in a ditch just off the runway, was the result of loss of control on landing. Now, one pilot suggests that as a tail dragger, you have to fly it until it's in the hangar. The plane flies regularly in American air shows to tell the story of the Japanese 
Pearl Harbor attack on December 7, 1941, T-6s are painted with Japanese markings to imitate the Japanese Zero Fighter. And the Shell Aerobatic Team flies the T-6 in daytime air shows. And nighttime air shows. The T-6 will be with us for decades to come. Morning, everybody. Good morning. And our T-6 team is on its way out. Gosh, thanks. Good to see you all. All right. Alex? So here's our, our T6 team. Um, starting for, for the audience at your far right uh, is Mike Ginter. Uh, oh, you know him. Uh, he's the president of NADA, North American. Uh, more applause for NADA, yeah. Uh, former naval aviator. Five deployments, Persian Gulf. 3,000 hours in the cockpit. 555, the Navy calls them traps, that's arrested landing on aircraft carriers. Got 1,000 hours in the SNJ, uh, which is the T-6, as you all know. Uh, 2015, in Washington, D.C., VE Day celebration, he directed and led the flyover of 56 airplanes down the mall, all warbirds. Any of you happen to see that or were there in Washington that day? It was magnificent, Mike. Uh, sitting next to him, Alan Henley, co-founder of the Aeroshell team you just saw on the screen. 27 years of flying air shows and 4,000 hours in the SNJ. My gosh. Uh, next to him, uh, Next to him, Brigadier General George Schulstad, 6,200 hours, Air Force retired, uh, 25 years service. Uh, he flew exchanges in the F-86 with the RCAF and flew the F-8U Crusader in an exchange with the Navy as a naval aviator, and he flew in Vietnam and the Tonkin Gulf. Uh, that's He's a good General man. George Schulstad. And next to me, retired Major General Alex McDonald, 9,000 hours in the cockpit, 45 years of service, many types of aircraft, props and jets, is a very highly decorated retired Air Force officer, General McDonald. Mike, start us off. First of all, NADA. What does NADA do? Well, thank you for hosting this for us. Uh, North American Trainer Association is... Uh, is the uh, T6, T28, P51, and B25 type club. Uh, and uh, we also are the formation uh, signatory, formation training signatory for T6s, T28s, and P51s. So uh, we are the folks that, that we've got about 1,000 members. Uh, the organization's been around since 1985. Uh, it started out as the T6 Association, and then our uh, 31 years of uh, leadership under Kathy and Stoney Stonish, they changed it to NADA and brought in the T-28s and the rest of the North American aircraft, and it became a big family. And the last couple of years, we, we grew by about 28%, and we brought in the uh, fighter signatory. So NADA now trains all the T-6s, T-28s, and all the fighters, not just Mustangs. So what, how big a day is this for trainer aircraft? Well, it's, it's a great day. Today's really a NADA day for us to celebrate the 80th anniversary of the T-6. And uh, working with the great folks here at EAA Warbirds, they gave us about an hour of today's air show. And uh, as the president and a former naval officer, I've always believed what's good, what good's a little authority unless you abuse it a little bit. So I, uh, I convinced them to let me make it a family birthday party, not just T-6s, but we brought the whole family in. So today's air show, you're going to see about 63 North American aircraft uh, starting at about 3.30. About halfway through the show is the NADA part. And the T-6s will be featured, but we're going to have fighters, uh, B-25, and a bunch of T-28s. 
How, Mike, how significant is this airplane? You just mentioned the big anniversary of this airplane. But how significant is it and has it been for all these decades? Well, I'll, I'll introduce that answer, but uh, these gentlemen can probably do a much better job. The T-6, uh, about 17,000 built, and I think the number varies, but it's a lot. And uh, it was the trainer aircraft for just about every pilot in World War II, and I think up to 34 allied nations uh, during and after the war. So it was in military service with the Spanish Air Force until the 80s and the South African Air Force until the 90s. And that's the reason why so many were uh, well-maintained, and when they were surplused into civilian hands, they were a lot of folks bought them and brought them back to the States. So. We've got 600 left. It's a, it's a significant part of the military aviation training history. I'll defer to the generals for more on that, but, uh, and to Alan, of course, but uh, it's a huge part of it. Everybody knows the T-6, uh, air shows and the military guys. It's an iconic airplane. We're proud to be a part of the association. Alan, in your 4,000 hours in this airplane, um, how do you describe this airplane compared to flying others? You know, it's, it's an airplane that uh, flown correctly. It's a wonderful, uh, it's actually, once you kind of get the hang of it, it's a very docile airplane, uh, we like to think it is. Uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful trainer. It's got uh, so many great features that, um, you know, it, it makes you, it makes you work hard at the things you need to work hard on, like directional control. Uh, but it's a very pleasing airplane to fly. The controls are very harmonic. Uh, some of the other fighters I've flown, you know, they may be heavy rudder and light ailerons or something, you know. But the T6, everything is very harmonic. It's nothing's you know, nothing's real stiff. Nothing. Uh, it's just a really pleasing airplane to fly in the air. I think most of us are amazed watching, you know, the Aeroshell team that you co-founded fly these shows not only during the day but at night as well. Describe that experience for us of that kind of formation flying that tight, that close, and at night. Uh, well, you know, we're in our uh, 33rd year together as a team, and we started doing the um, the day show probably did that for about 10 or 12 years and then started doing a late evening performance uh, kind of right at, at sundown. Uh, and we've started realizing that, uh, first of all, it was a pleasure to fly at that time of day because it's you know starting to cool off and the wind and the turbulence disappears and it's just really smooth and it's fun to do. I always tell people, I say, yeah, we do the day show to earn the privilege to get the night to do the night show, and uh, but what may it's kind of an optical, uh, I wouldn't say an optical illusion, but uh, at night when we're flying the show, you're looking up at us, and the airplanes are kind of dark looking. We're actually uh, from a height at, uh, advantage, you know, your whatever sunlight that's left actually hits the ground and backs, bounces back to us. So we can actually see better work from our advantage than the crowd can looking up at the airplanes. And so even though it really starting to look kind of dark, things are still somewhat illuminated on the ground. Uh, so we, it's not like we're flying black dark. It, uh, we do more what they call a twilight show, and there is some residual light left over. Uh, so we can still see the ground and see each other. Uh, it's, it's just fun. <laughs> just fun. As long, to use your term, as long as you fly it correctly. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, you had an experience in the back seat flying formation one of these? Well, I did. I uh, actually had the honor of riding in the back of uh, Alan's brother, uh, Mark Henley. I rode in the back of his airplane at a friend of ours air show down in uh, Vicksburg, Mississippi. And I was actually still in command of a squadron, so I was an active duty Navy guy still flying, and I kind of had Navy regulations on the brain, but I was able to jump in the back seat of yeah. your brother's airplane, and he was on the right wing, and, uh, and I'm used to a brief 90 minutes prior, very st working, structured, and you follow the rules and regulations, and 
And uh, these guys were hanging out with their elbows on the wing, or, uh, their uh, horizontal stabilizers, and uh, said, "All right, you guys are ready to go." And uh, and I thought, "Okay, we're getting ready to have a brief." And they then we Mark said, "Come on, let's lo let's load up." <laughs> so that was the brief. And of course, these guys breathe together. They're so incredible. You, you've all seen them, but. Uh, so I got in the back seat, and uh, it was the most incredible experience of my life. First thing Mark and, his, and Steve did, I guess Steve was on the left wing, yeah. they, they take off and step up. And if anybody's flown formation, we always teach step down so that when the leader turns into you, you're already below the wing, and you can stay safe, and it's, just, it's a step down. You've seen it in all the videos. These guys step up on the wings, so they're looking down at the lead, and when the lead turns into you, you got to turn a lot quicker to stay above him but not lose sight. And then they did that doing an aileron roll and a barrel roll and a loop. So I told uh, Mark when we landed that I'm really glad. And here I was, a jet guy in command of a squadron. I kind of know a little bit what's going on. I'm glad they removed the stick in the back seat because I told Mark I would have saved us about 20 times. <laughs> <laughs> Alex, General Alex, when was your first meeting with a T-6? Uh, it's kind of interesting, you know, in World War II, where you started out with the PT, and you went to the BT, and then you went to the AT, which was the AT-6. When George and I got to Goodfellow Air Force Base, Texas, in 1951, they showed us the AT-6 and said, this is the airplane you're going to start flying. So we started in that airplane wow. and uh, flew it all the time. We were at uh, Goodfellow. So what was it like to begin in that particular airplane without the other planes that you mentioned? Well, I, I didn't know the difference. So my instructor was a second lieutenant that hadn't graduated very much before I started. And he was very forgiving and very understanding. And when he finally soloed me out, I took off and turned her on and checked the back seat to make sure he wasn't hiding back there to protect me. <laughs> but uh, it was a great experience and a great airplane, and uh, I was privileged to fly it in Korea in combat. At the time, I didn't think it was a privilege. But We'll, uh, we'll get to that in just a couple of minutes. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we will for sure. George, you're also a good fellow in Texas? Right, absolutely, yeah. In uh, 1951, uh, reported into Goodfellow Air Force Base at San Angelo, Texas. Uh, I had gone through Lackland as a private, so uh, uh, when I reported in, became an aviation cadet in pilot class 52A, the, uh, uh, the monthly pay went from 49 to $75 a month, which was a, a good deal. Uh, but uh, got in the airplane, my instructor was first lieutenant George M. Lake from Santa Ana, California. Uh, right out of central casting, tall, fair-haired, good-looking guy. Been in World War II for the last uh, few months of it. Had been in combat down in the Pacific. And uh, so he had visions of uh, going to jet school and going over to Korea and becoming an ace. Instead, he finds himself as an instructor pilot in the back seat teaching us green guys how to fly an airplane. So it was my first time ever in an airplane in the front seat. He said, just follow me through on the controls. Don't try to do anything. We took off, went about two, three miles uh, away from the air base. There was a ravine there. He took it right down to the cactus, turned it upside down, pushed forward on the stick. All the stuff came off the floor down me and he said, now, you little blankety blank, I'm going to teach you how to fly an airplane. And that he did, <laughs> and for which I'm forever grateful. He was a taskmaster. Uh, he absolutely insisted on everything being done perfectly, or you just kept on doing it until you did it perfectly. So I'm really grateful to Lieutenant George M. Lake from Santa Ana, California. Yeah. Well, you know, Alan talked about flying the airplane correctly, and we've Mike, yeah. yeah. Mike? Sir. Oh, uh, the thinking about the ground handling qualities, and we hear that it can be squirrely or whatever on the ground. Uh, to what extent have any of you had those kinds of problems yeah. in handling the T6 on the ground? Uh, I was lucky I never did. Uh, never had a problem. I never had a problem, but I've had a lot of challenges. Uh, yeah. Yeah. In 4,000 hours, I never 
never scratched it one time, but yeah. uh, I've had it try to a time or two. You know, you come yeah. in, the wind's blowing, yeah. you know, 90 miles, you know, and uh, come in there and crosswind, you just drive it on and get it on the ground. And like yeah. I say, you never stop flying it till you got it yeah. in the hangar. You got it. Never stop flying it right up to the hangar. Exactly. <laughs> so, so yeah. They used to say if you're flying a T-6, you be either ground loop one or you're going to ground loop one. Yeah. 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 Mike, what's your experience with it? You've got a lot of time. Well, I'm lucky. Uh, I'm in the category of I'm going to ground loop one. I haven't done it yet. So, uh, <laughs> But I echo the comments. It's a squirrely in a crosswind, and you really got to stay ahead of it. So. Right. Back to Korea, uh, Alex. You had how many, 56 missions, 36 missions in North Korea? Yeah. What, what, were, you, what were your missions and describe them to us? Well, uh, basically what we did is we had an uh, uh, Army officer in the back seat. And uh, we'd go out and either the, uh, the ground liaison officer would call us on the radio and tell us about some target give us the coordinates of a target, we'd go look at it and decide whether it was a target that we could uh, take care of from the air or whether it wasn't, or else we'd go look and see if we could find anything. And the fighters would uh, check in with us. And now, what were the fighters that were checking in with you? 84s, 86s, Corsairs, Sky Raiders, everything. Wow. So, and what kind of munitions were you carrying? See those little 2.75 rockets there? Yeah. That was our, that's all we had. Uh, we, all we did was mark the target. If we, if, if the fighter pilot couldn't see the target, and we describe where to look, and usually they could find it. If they couldn't, why, well, we would sometimes go in and mark it with a, a uh, white phosphorus, Willie Peter rocket, gives a big plume of white out of it, and then say, well, it's 10 meters north of that or south of that or whatever. And uh, they'd say, okay, I got the target. We'd say, okay, make your pass from east to west, break north. I put in a flight of ADs one time, and the squadron leader, they'd taken off down south, the squadron leader yeah. said, he couldn't find a target. We had a terrible time. And finally, he said, I think I got it. And I said, well, okay, roll in. If you don't have it, don't release any ammunition. If you don't, are you sure you don't have it? He says, I've been climbing since I left my base. I'm going to drop a 2,000-pound bomb on this pass. If I don't drop it, I can't pull out. Well, lucky enough, he had the target. <laughs> so where, where were you based, and how far north, if you were flying in the north, did you have to fly? Where were you based? We were at K-47, which was, uh, oh, I don't know, it wasn't too far south of the DMZ or what became the DMZ. Right. Our missions usually lasted just a little over two and a half hours, short of three hours. And we covered the... Uh, the east coast and the middle of Korea, and the other squadron covered the middle and the west coast. So, George, did you fly the T-6 anymore after you trained in it? No, I, I trained in it in San Angelo, and then we went to advanced training uh, in uh, a couple of bases, in uh, one in uh, West Texas at Lubbock, and then uh, the one I went to was at Enid, Oklahoma, which is an advanced training to this day in the U.S. Air Force. Uh, and we were, uh, we flew the B-25 a little bit, and then they said, okay, all you guys that have been qualified to go to fighters, uh, we're gonna put you back in the T-6, so I got another 100 hours in the T-6 up in Enid, Oklahoma. And they turned us loose. As a matter of fact, one quick story, uh, I got a new uh, instructor pilot, and he had never flown the T-6 before. And so he said to we uh, four cadet, aviation cadets, uh, I'm here for you guys to check me out the T-6, because by that time we had about 130, 150 hours. And he said, by the way, I'm supposed to become an instructor pilot in this thing, 
and if you guys ground loop or cause an accident, you're going to get washed out. So he said, okay, who's going to be first? We all sat on our hands. He finally looked at me and he said, how about you? And so, <laughs> so I took him up and we made the around. They had to do touch and goes to show him everything. He's in the back seat and stuff like that. And then taxi over to the grass uh, to where my other three colleagues were. And uh, I want to tell you, I landed that thing very gently. <laughs> I didn't do a three-point landing. I touched her down on the wheels, and luckily everything was just fine. I taxied her over the grass, put the locks on, the brakes, and climbed out, gave him a salute, uh, jumped off the back end of the airplane. The next guy was in line, and I went over <laughs> there and said, Wow. Well, yeah. <laughs> that was the biggest test I had in aviation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Alan, when you hear things like these stories, yeah. with all your T6 time, what goes through your head when you start hearing these tales? I can relate to all that, you know, just having put so many hours in them. And, and uh, the airplane, can it can be humbling. Uh, the one thing with flying a tail, oh, and I wanted to, I forgot my manners. This is my son, Brandon, yeah. is standing with us. But, uh, hey, Brandon. Yeah. Anyway, but, you know, the, uh, the a T-6 is one of those airplanes you'll fly it, and it'll just be, you know, everything's going good. And all of a sudden, just out of the blue, it'll, like, it'll swerve or do something. You wonder, where did that come from? Yeah. And uh, it's an airplane. If you ever get complacent, it will bite you. In a hurry, uh, you know, as long as everything's going, you know, good, right. and uh, it will give you almost kind of a sense of uh, false confidence that, you know, oh, this thing's nothing to it, and then all of a sudden it will just, it'll something will happen. So you just got to stay on your toes. Mike, what with NADA, with teaching, when did they start teaching or qualifying people to fly formation? So uh, <clears throat> with. Uh, People buying T6s, uh, one of our friends calls it the gateway drug to fighters. You have to get a couple hundred hours in T6s before you can move on to something bigger. That's usually an insurance requirement. But uh, basically our entrance uh, criteria is you got to have about 50 hours in the airplane. We don't, we don't check the log books, but the 50 hours before you start formation training with us is to make sure you know how to fly your own airplane. Uh, some of our instructors uh, aren't certified flight instructors. They're just excellent formation instructors so and we're not the backseaters are not the pilot in command ever so our, some of our instructors aren't there to teach the guy how to fly so the requirement is you got to know how to fly your own airplane handle your emergencies land it with wheels and with the three point and then we get them going into a syllabus so the first flight we give every formation guy is called an eval flight it's a single ship with an instructor and we make sure they know how to stall and accelerated stall and recover and do a couple landings and make sure we can feel comfortable in the back. And then we put them in two ship. When they're good with that, we put them in four ship and then we give them a check ride. It takes about maybe eight to 10, maybe 20 sorties, depending on the skill of the pilot. How challenging is formation flying? Well, it's, uh, uh, it's that's a tough question. This is the guy to answer that one. It's, it's uh, two points in space that are moving and the, the, the the cliche is you're never in position. You're you're moving from out of position through in position to out of position again. So it's kind of like a three-dimensional dynamic thing. And and I guess the trick, and you guys have mastered it, is to get those uh, diversions down to a one-foot box so you keep your head in the same one-foot box and then to the ground it looks like you never move. But I can tell you they're they're always moving relative to each other. So yeah. Yeah. How hard is it? Uh, you like driving a car on the highway. You learn it after a while, and then almost becomes second nature. Yeah. What, uh, Alex, uh, you were just nodding about that, but how much formation flying did you do, not only in the T6, but later? Well, it, 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 a lot, but uh, at Craig Air Force Base in, in uh, Alabama, Selma, Alabama, after I graduated from Goodfell, and uh, we went in there to fly the 51. So we flew the T-6 for another uh, 60 hours or something like that. Then we went into the 51. And the only thing we flew from then on was formation, basically, in the 51 and uh, some instrument flying in the T-6. And that was basically the whole rest of the uh, pilot training until we got our wings. And then I went, and then I, this is what I was 
telling you that I was privileged to fly the T-6 in combat. That was not a privilege. I, was, I flew the 51 for a year, became combat qualified in the 51. I was uh, going to Korea as a P-51 pilot. I got to Korea. They said, oh, we don't have 51s anymore. We got rid of the last of them. How much jet time do you have? They said, how about zero? T-6s. <laughs> <laughs> And everybody, the first thing they'd ask you when you got to the squadron is, how did you screw up that you're here? Because it was, uh, at that time, considered the bottom of the whole row was flying the T-6. So, Bob, you flew so many different airplanes, including Navy. How did you wind up getting an exchange as a naval aviator? Well, it was a Department of Defense pilot exchange program, uh, purpose of which to seek commonality and understand the missions of our sister services and uh, being able to uh, report on things where more commonality, such as ground power units and other kinds of things, which uh, were unique to certain services. and and make those more important. Also tactics, uh, operational communications, all that sort of stuff. So that was the essence of the Department of Defense Pilot Exchange Program. And I was privileged to be assigned to a Navy unit, uh, Naval Air Station Miramar. And I went to what they called the Fleet Replacement Program at Crusader College, F-8 Crusader College, uh, Top Gun School at uh, Navy uh, Miramar. And so I took uh, several weeks of uh, training there, care called on the USS Coral Sea uh, with five day and five night. A little story in between there, we got our five day uh, tra traps done. We had supper and a wardroom mess. And uh, then we had the briefing uh, by the operations officer for our five night qualification. There were seven of us. Two uh, commanders who had fighter squadron units waiting for them to report in as skippers. One lieutenant commander, one, Air, uh, one Navy captain, and a uh, couple of junior officers and me. And uh, so uh, the, uh, uh, the operations officer said, okay, Night carrier operations are exactly like daytime carrier operations, except it's dark as hell and you can't see anything. Uh, th that was the briefing. And, and he said, uh, the order of uh, night carrier will be the two uh, uh, senior instructors and the two senior student commander is going to be squadron commanders, the lieutenant commander, the lieutenant, the junior officers, Air Force, you're gonna be dead last because we wanna make sure it's very dark when you take your <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Mike. If I could just interject, I just can't help this, but as a Navy guy, it does my heart proud to hear an Air Force general talk so lovingly about carrier life. Thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, the Navy would often, uh, uh, or, you know, the, the unwashed might say, well, how was it landing on a carrier? What does an Air Force guy say? It's a piece of cake, of course. Uh, sure, <laughs> sure. But well, we, were, tell we were very well trained in Navy operations and in that particular fighter. It was an honor and a privilege uh, and in, uh, had two combat tours on Yankee Station. Unfortunately, we uh, lost some people, two uh, skippers in a uh, span of three weeks, uh, two JOs, uh, my wingmen on a night carrier landing, uh, and uh, so. But it, w it was an honor and a privilege to fly with the United States. What Navy. was the first time piece of cake landing on the, on the boat? What was it like the first time you looked down at the yeah. carrier 
yeah. and knew that you didn't have an instructor in the airplane with you, and you were going to land on that little yeah. thing. Well, it uh, it it was uh, you know uh, uh, awesome, and uh, and here's the ship going this way, and you know the angle deck is 11 degrees off the direction that the ship is going. So you're always correcting. You always go across the wake, uh, and you're correcting to go in to land here 11 degrees off while the ship is moving like this. But you have directions from the Fresnel land and the landing signal officer, the LSO paddles, they call them, and so on. So He's the procedures good. were very clear. You follow the procedures. You do uh, what you're supposed to do. Uh, you uh, factor that in with your Air Force training, and, uh, and everything goes well. And by the way, by the time I went on exchange, I had about 3,000 hours of flying time. So that was an advantage. I mean, I'd been a fighter pilot for uh, quite a while and flown in different environments, including the RCAF tour or NATO. Right. And, uh, yeah. Mike, as he explains this, as an Air Force guy explaining the Navy uh, procedures, you know, you're here, are you operations officer, OPSO on a carrier, and so you've got, what did I say, 555 traps? My gosh. But what, what is that? How do you describe that experience, and how, how is it different from what Air Force guys do landing on runways? Well, as a Navy captain to an Air Force general, you got it exactly right, sir. Nice job. <laughs> and he did. It was, it was exactly the right experience. So it's an incredible uh, thing to experience day and night, and over time you get a little, a little more comfortable with it. You know, we, uh, you don't realize it when you're doing it, but uh, we all live at certain points on the stress performance curve where uh, stress increases to some maximum point your performance falls off, so you want to stay near the top or maybe the left side of that curve. And over time, I think we get more and more comfortable with day landings. It actually becomes fun. We actually want to go out and do more of it. Bag traps, we call it. Nobody ever asked to get extra landings at night. You know, that's usually a, that's a, it's a lot less moving parts. It's a straight in approach on needles, but uh, it's a deprivation of sensory input, which I think is the stressor. Uh, at night. At but, night, yeah. All you can see is the two-dimensional lineup for left and right and glide slope for up and down. You really can't see the ship at all. It's, it's dark. So you see the lineup and you see the vertical, but you don't have any perception of depth to the carrier. And at some point, you stop looking at your instruments and you just focus visually on the meatball and lineup. And it's not till the last about four or five seconds where the the low, uh, the low light uh, deck lights start to become visible, and you see the island go by, and you catch a wire. So, so it's, uh, Alan, how jealous are you that you never got to do that? I would love to have had the opportunity. Uh, I'd like to kind of interject, though. You know, the here we are, 80 years. You know, and and it is such a wonderful trader. Something we hadn't talked about. Uh, in my experience, uh, flying the T6. I was, you know, in my early 20s, and uh, my dad had bought the SNJ that I flew in the air shows for years, had bought it, uh, and uh, he bought the T6 in 73, and then we ended up with a Mustang in 79, and I started flying the T6 in the early 80s, and uh, since my dad had started flying the Mustang, the T6 kind of sat in the back of the hangar and started collecting dust, and and, and we had a steerman at that time. I started flying it. I'd been flying a Cub, and and I said, I sure would like to fly that T6 a little bit. And and he goes, Well, you know how to start it. And I said, Well, I think I can figure it. He hand me the book. He said, Read the book. And go fly the thing. And, and that was my check out in the T6. I just read the book, and we had a 2,500 foot grass strip down the country, and I just got in and started flying it. And wow. so anyway, I, uh, over about a year and a half, two years, I, I ended up with about 35 hours at that time in a T6. And I kind of said the same thing about flying a Mustang. And, and he goes, well, you got a book? <laughs> and he said, read the book and, and uh, go fly it. And anyway, so I got in this Mustang. And, and uh, like I said, I had like 35 hours in a T6. And went out there and, and did everything the you know the manual said do. And went out and, and flew the airplane, and uh, I got a big surprise when I 
you know, I ran it down the runway the first time at about 40 inches. And uh, I didn't get the tail up. I just wanted to make sure I could keep it straight down the runway. And everything seemed pretty good. So I went taxi back. And I had a little bit of a wind from the left, which uh, that bit me. And a few seconds later, that bit me. But <laughs> I rolled the canopy forward. And I said, all right. I went to about 40 inches and got going down the runway. So I went in and shoved it up to about 55. And not being able to see that well over the nose, I popped the tail up. And of course, I had that left wind and plus the gyroscopic precession. I popped the tail up, that thing made a left turn. And I'm sitting here pushing all I can do on the right right rudder. And I'm headed toward the edge of the runway. And, and anyway, by the time I got to the edge of the runway, the, it, we, I started, I got off the ground. And I was like, Pew, yeah. you idiot, what have you done this time? <laughs> <laughs> And anyway, so I took off and, and flew the airplane, did some air work, did some stalls and stuff. And I thought, well, since I got it in the air, I don't know how it's going to be on landing. And so I went and buzzed everybody I knew because I said, this, at least I got to fly it one time. <laughs> and I came back in and entered the pattern and, you know, did everything the book said. Came in to land, flared, and it just kissed on just as such a sweet. And when I got on the ground and rolled out, the back of my mind, I was going, you know, that was so familiar because I'd flown the T6 first. And oh. it did what it was supposed to do. The T6 is such a great trainer getting you ready for high-performance tail dragger fighters. It did what it's supposed to do. Yeah. Alex, compare for you, from your experience flying the T6 to, say, the P-51 or other propeller-driven aircraft. Well, I, th I think Al is absolutely right. The T-6 prepares you for that 51. And uh, flying a 51 is kind of like having a convertible and uh, <laughs> a 300 horsepower engine and driving down the interstate at 140 miles an hour. That's what it's like. Uh, you couldn't want anything better. Right. Uh, is it more difficult or easier to fly than the T-6? It's different. I don't think it's either easier or harder. It's just different. It's uh, a little more powerful. You got you got uh, more rudder problems because of the big engine and, and that. But uh, it's a little easier on landing, I think, than a T6 is. Yeah. And so yeah, six to one and a half does the other two. Bob, what about you? Compare the six to other aircraft you flew. Well, I think uh, as. <clears throat> As the uh, the Brits and the Canucks named it, the Harvard, uh, you know, it prepares you for future aviation, and it does so in one heck of a great way because of the uh, the the particular characteristics of flying the T6, and you have to pay uh, attention to what you're doing all the time because of some of these little tricky situations yeah. that evolve from nowhere, right? <laughs> and, and you have to be prepared. Uh, hey, yeah, you know, after I got back from Korea flying a T-6 over there, they sent me to basic instructor school in the T-28. Tricycle gear, I mean, it was like nothing. Yeah. Just sitting there yeah. compared to the T-6 yeah. or the 51. Yeah. T-28 was a piece uh, of cake. Fine. As well, like those yeah, carrier landings. It, yeah. Piece <laughs> George, I wanted to go to the Mustang so bad. <laughs> George, did you ever fly any other North American products, the T28 or B25 or anything? No, no. no. Uh, uh, I flew the B25 for about four hour, 40 hours in uh, in aviation cadets at Enid, Oklahoma. Uh, most of which was gotten on cross countries and stuff like that, navigation training. It was a good navigation trainer. And, uh, Alec, you flew a bunch yeah. of the North American Yeah, I've flown, yeah, I've I've flown, flown all of the, of the NAT airplanes. Mm -hmm. Not much time in the B-25. That was when I decided I didn't want to be in the Air Force. I wanted to go in the Guard and fly fighters. Yeah. So, George, also your, your naval experience uh, flying combat in Vietnam. Yeah. What springs to mind as your most memorable experiences flying combat in Vietnam? Well... I, I think uh, <clears throat> a couple of things I, I mentioned. Uh, the, the second cruise, first cruise is on the USS Kitty Hawk, which, uh, as they would call it, a big deck 
uh, aircraft carrier in the Constellation class. And uh, on the second cruise, the Navy doesn't go to war, they go on cruises during which you might get shot at a lot, you understand that. And uh, so uh, the, the, we were then reassigned uh, because the Vietnam thing was going on pretty strong. Our, uh, from Air Wing 11, hence the three digit 111, fighter squadron 111, we were reassigned to Air Wing 2, two digit, and, which was based out of Alameda, California. So uh, all the stuff after uh, cruise come back from the standard nine month cruise, uh, Westpac on uh, USS Kitty Hawk became an 11 and a half month cruise. And uh, then just a couple months later, we're on our way out with uh, USS Midway, which was built during uh, World War II and uh, waning days of World War II. And it was built in three sections. Uh, and uh, so it had three uh, section stuff on the deck. And hence, the Midway had its own uh, uh, unique characteristics going through the water. And in heavy seas, uh, you know, uh, over five or six, uh, uh, what the Navy would characterize as a sea state and you get up to uh, higher numbers, uh, it would do uh, kind of a midway dance, we would call it. Front section would do one thing, the rear section would do something else, and the middle section didn't know what was going on. The purpose of the three uh, compartments was in case of a strike by uh, torpedoes or bombs in World War II, uh, they could seal that section off and deal with it and still keep the other stuff going. Hence. We did have some rough seas, and to answer your question, uh, was bringing my wingman back uh, from a night mission, a daytime, nighttime strike. And uh, as we were coming in, you know, you can take off two or three or four, but you can only land one at a time. And uh, so you bring the wingman in, and uh, as soon as he calls the ball, which Mike described, uh, then the leader goes around, changes frequencies, and comes around and land. So I trapped, and I could tell that deck was moving an awful lot. And you could hardly walk. So uh, I asked for permission when I found out uh, that an old Nick was still airborne, and he was the youngest J.O. in the squadron the least amount of time asked permission of the skipper to go out to the platform where the LSO is. And you get, we were taking water in the hang, hangar deck, to, and you had to go there to get up. On, and there was room for just uh, three guys on the LSO thing. Nick came in, got a wave off, because uh, just as he got in close, it went down, front end went up, 